further ado, I can't wait to hear what Manny has to say about his next um, World Leadership Award. So Manny, please. My first question, Paul, tell me how is it that you were able to get in touch with my mother? Because truly, uh, only my mother would be saying things like, like, like you said. Um, I am very, very honored to, to hear those words. And uh, if you're ever looking for a job in PR, just give me a call, OK? Uh, wow, wow, wow. You know. <laughs> Coming here today, um, be, be, actually before I came here, uh, I was talking to Art, Art Ehrman and talking about what, what are we going to talk about. And I, I said a few words about, you know, maybe talk about Minnesota and, and things like that. And he said, no, no, Manny, Manny, just remember we do have a lot of people here from other countries and other areas of the country. And... Um, and you know we, we don't want to get too much into into Minnesota. And I thought about that a lot, and I said, okay, I'll tone it down a little bit, you know. And so uh, put my talk together and things like that. And then finally, I uh, started listening to the news, on uh, you know the late news and things like that. And and they were talking about a subject matter that uh, really, I think, uh, it's gonna require us to take a moment from my talk, because I think it's very, 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 very important that we get to a very important matter, okay? So before I start talking about the lessons of uh, in medical device innovations, I would like to ask everybody if they could just bow their heads, and we're gonna say a little prayer for the twins. I mean, come on, the record is eight and zero. No, correction, I got a plexia here. Zero and eight, okay? And uh, so I, I was taking, trying to think about what I could say about it and show you. And for some of you who may not know, in Minnesota we have an unusual, unproportional love for baseball. I mean, we only have about two weeks of good weather and all of these things, and yet we love baseball. Now this happens to be the pitch, uh, the, a picture of the first pitch at the new stadium a few years back. And you notice where the, uh, where the baseball is, and uh, I thought it was pretty good, it's right here, okay? And uh, I thought it was a great picture. So I took it and I had it blown up and I gave it to uh, Mr. Polad. If you ever wanna see a grown man cry, I had it nicely framed, et cetera, et cetera, and he, and he saw it, and he realized that uh, what I was trying to say to him, thank you for bringing uh, outdoor baseball back to Minnesota. Now, the next slide, I debated a lot about showing, uh, because again, there's a lot of people here from out of town who may not know my background, but you don't want to hear any more about my background after the introduction that I had. So I, I will definitely, definitely skip this. It cannot do uh, any justice to it. So let's, do, let's talk about medical innovations, okay? And you are sitting in a spot, uh, literally just a few hundred yards away from where it all began. Uh, could you imagine trying to do open heart surgery before we had heart-lung machines and things like that? Could you imagine being a surgeon in which before the uh, noontime, you may have lost one or two or three kids before you even got to lunch, okay? Those were all the things that started here. Those were the innovation started, but, but the first lesson that you have to know about innovation is what I like to call persistence. So let's just talk about a few things as my computer is giving me a hard time here, okay? 
So we go back to the early 50s when uh, Dr. John Lewis was working in hypothermia. And, and I, I always laugh at the next slide here because, um, again, where else can you talk about hypothermia than in Minnesota? Okay. And I'm always amazed that when they were doing the first open heart surgery, the, if you take a look at this picture, and 11 people in the OR, not, not the typical two or three or so. And I noticed the gloves on these girls, uh, the nurses, uh, big, heavy, thick rubber gloves. I mean, all of these things sound so crude today. Um, and of course, the first one was hypothermia in, that uh, Dr. Lewis did back in September of 52, in which they took a child and would put him literally in a, in a, in a big, large pail, a, a, water, a water pail. I, they used to use a different term, troth or something like that. Fill it up with ice and try to work on a child. Uh, but they were able to do it. They did uh, Jackie Johnson, age five, sent her home 11 days later. And today at 69, she's still living in Puerto, uh, in Puerto Rico, Florida. Then let's come to the other pioneers. Clarence Dennis, University of Minnesota. And he was working on a heart-lung machine. What can we do to give the doctor more time to open up a child's heart and work on that child? So he developed the open heart surgery for the heart-lung machine. And he used the machine for a correction of a congenital heart disease back in children, back in 1952. But the first 17 patients died. Think about that one. 11 in the OR. How many of you would have the guts to continue, to continue, to be persistent? I don't know about you. I don't think I could do it. So Dennis left the University of Minnesota, abandoned cardiac surgery. I think after 17, I would have abandoned it too. And then came along John Gibbons, both here and at the University of Minnesota and also at the Mayo Clinic. And he developed a uh, machine called the Mayo Gibbons heart-lung machine. And he did the first successful use of cardiopulmonary bypass. He did a ASD closure and but he was unable to repeat that. Okay, all you guys working on innovations, new products and stuff like that, you know, how often do you have to keep going back and back and back to try it again and again and again? And all I'm trying to say here is some of our early pioneers didn't have many of the tools, kept, kept at it. Now he was unable to repeat this success, operate on four additional patients, and they all died. So he abandoned the pursuit of cardiopulmonary bypass. He left cardiac surgery, died playing tennis, but this is the first lesson that I wanted to talk about. Persistence. None of these things would, would come about, success come about without the persistence, as oh, our friend Mr. Churchill used to say, never, never, never give up. Enters C. Walton Lillehei, probably one of the most controversial individuals who ever want to meet, whoever did surgery, and he came out of the University of Minnesota. I am one of the very, very fortunate individuals who knew him personally, did a lot of work with him personally, and he was truly a, a great friend. So he goes to work in the lab, as we all did at one time or another, 
But he comes out of the lab with probably the most controversial idea ever. He says, why don't we make, why don't we do bypass surgery using a living organ, a living animal? This morning I was talking to uh, a young lady who was born in Wisconsin, who is a, uh, received, recently received a PhD here at the university. And I was talking, I said to her, do you know that when they're doing the very, very first successful bypass surgery, someone went to a farm in Wisconsin, a milk farm, dairy, dairy farm, and got a pump that pumps milk and brought it back to the University of Minnesota to start doing open heart surgery where a milk pump was the pump. In this early sketch, we see that Dr. Lillehei was saying in the animal lab, why don't we use two animals, one a recipient, the other one a donor, in which the donor is the heart and lung for the recipient. And as you can see, right over here, right about here, there's the pump. So Walt went to his boss, Dr. Wagenstein, chief of surgery at the time, at the University of Minnesota, back on the night of March 25th, 1954. I don't know what you guys were doing. Many of you, of course, weren't born. What the hell was I doing in 1954? <laughs> yeah, okay. And he wrote a little note to his boss, and he, uh, I'm sorry, his boss wrote him a little note after he had requested permission. And I said, Dr. Lillehei, Walt, by all means, go ahead. He wanted to use this concept in which he would take a child and take a parent, either mother or father, use that milk pump, and with two of his colleagues, Dr. Cohn and Dr. Warden, in which he said to uh, uh, the guys, he said, look, I'm going to take care of the child, but I want you to take care of the father. Keep an eye on the father. So, so here we are. Doing the first cross circulation on March 26. There's the child. There's the father. There's Professor Lillehei, Dr. Cohen, Dr. Warden. Not looking at the father. I don't know why. Okay. <laughs> All right. And this was a distinguished crowd because we had in that crowd also. Dr. Shumway from California, who, by the way, Dr. Shumway's daughter, again, is a cardiac surgeon here at the University of Minnesota. Sure enough, they did it. It was published, or I should say presented to the world in the Minneapolis Tribune in May. So when we talk about innovation and persistence, the second lesson is risk. If you're not a risk taker, if you don't, you know, if you're, if you're not that kind of a person, I got to tell you, uh, the ideas are not going to come because the idea usually comes to you say, oh yeah, we can do A and B and C. No one's ever done it. What happens if C goes wrong or B goes wrong? What happens if you don't take the risk? None of the innovations will happen. In my opinion, Dr. Lillehei was the greatest risk taker of all. He was ostracized for this operation. He says people were saying, you know, he should be thrown out of the medical society, et cetera, et cetera, because here's a guy who developed a procedure probably would not have a 100% failure rate, but probably 200% failure rate. So think about that. Coming up with an idea that 
may threaten one life, no, two lives. Now, let's go to the lessons from the entrepreneurial point of view. I, um, these are some of my ideas, some of my thoughts. And why do you do these things? Why do you take these crazy ideas, Manny? Why do you take these crazy risks? And I say that the greatest pleasure in life is doing what people say cannot be done. Think about that. Here is a picture of the Kitty Hawk and, uh, back in 1909. And uh, two weeks before this picture was taken, the New York Times did an article and said that lighter than air aircraft would not exist for another thousand years. So these guys were going after something people say can't be done. But they did it. I also tell the individual who wants to be the entrepreneur that uh, be ready for all the critics, the naysayers. You know, you're crazy. What are you doing? This is the greatest uh, naysayer that I could find. Everything that can be invented has been invented. Uh, this was happened to come from the director of the U.S. Patent Office, <laughs> Dr. Duell, and back in 1899. If you've got a better naysayer than that one, will you see me after this? Because I want to put it in this, this presentation. Okay? All right. So now, <clears throat> now of course, we see on television, uh, television ads for Google and, and, and Apple and uh, Walt Disney, and they all show pictures of a garage where they started. But you gotta come back to Minnesota, and back in 1950, we started with a garage here. This was the garage that was used by Earl Bakken and Palmer Hermansley, the, the co-founders of Medtronic, to start the pacemaker, okay? And the pacemaker was uh, uh, about the size of a hockey puck. Would last maybe 18, 24 months. Okay. Uh, I got involved with, with them in, back in 1967. Uh, they brought me on board to help them bring the international market to them or bring the pacemaker to the international market. Had a lot of fun, but that, that desire to do things was underneath my shirt. And in fact, I, I always say that, uh, I always say to the audience, look guys, if you wanna be an entrepreneur, you have gotta open up your shirt. And you ladies can open up your blouses if you want and see if there's a big red S. Because if you don't have that that mantra, that, that feeling that you can do it better than somebody else, that you are better than, some, than the average Joe or the average Jane, uh, don't go after medical entrepreneurship because there are so many, so many hurdles ahead of you, you know? Because a lot of engineers say, well, gee, I know how to do this and this and this and I want to go and be an entrepreneur. I want to conquer the world and the whole thing. Uh, be careful. So back in 72, when these pacemakers were the size of a hockey puck and were lasting uh, 18, 24 months, I decided to uh, try and do it better. I came along and I was saying to people, gee, I'm gonna make a 10-year pacemaker. And again, they were saying, man, you're crazy, no way, it cannot be done. And I said, why? And they said, well, because Medtronic and Cordis and a few other companies overseas I've been trying for years, and the best they get is about two years. So a 10-year pacemaker can't be done? No, it cannot be done. Well, we made it. We did one. And we changed the way we made pacemakers. We hermetically sealed everything. We used hybrid technology. We used a different power source, a lithium power source. We used redundant circuitry. We used a whole bunch of different things that we did that that no one had done before. And we ended up with a pacemaker, and they were right. It wasn't a 10-year pacemaker. It was a 40-year pacemaker. My first pacemaker ran for 40 years. My mother's pacemaker, which was this one, 
lasted 35 years, okay? And then eventually we were able to make them smaller. And also the same technology was used to, for the first time, create defibrillators. Now, the next important lesson, you can't do it alone. And I don't mean, okay, you're gonna have a staff of people and all that sort of, I, I know that. You're gonna, you definitely cannot do the whole company by yourself. But the technology and the innovation and the designs, you gotta bring in people to help you. I've been extremely fortunate to have people help me. And they come, they call me up, Manny, what are you doing today? Well, I'm gonna be at the lab. Can I come into the lab with you? And things like that. In the upper left-hand corner, okay, we have uh, Walt Lalahai. We have Dr. H. David Freeberg, who was a very, one of the first electrophysiologists of, of, of importance in our country. We have Bill Greatbatch, the guy who invented the very first pacemaker when, and then went on to develop new power sources and lithium power sources working with me. We had guys from all over the world coming in to see what we were doing. Sidvark, first stent, okay. Um, Christian Barnard, who by the way, if I can find my pointer again, there we go. Right here in the middle here, Christian Barnard, who, who came out of the University of Minnesota, the guy who did the first heart transplant. Started here at the University of Minnesota. He also did some work uh, with Dr. Shumway out in California, but came on to study under Lowell High here. Billy Cohn, Texas Heart. So people will come and help you if you ask, or even if you don't ask. For me, I was very pleased and privileged and honored to have two of the greatest innovators Walt Lillehei and Dmitry Nikolov. Dmitry comes to me one day and says, Manny, why don't you do a, a heart valve? Uh, heart valve. I don't know, I'm sure there's a lot of you guys out here that have worked in pacemakers. You've been either salespeople, engineers, run some of these companies. And there's one thing about pacemaker that's terrible. The bad thing about pacemakers. You get addicted to them. They, you know, it's a, it's a product in which you go into a hospital and there's a patient that's blue, blue in the face and the whole thing. And then all of a sudden you put in a pacemaker, you make a connection and within 10 seconds you already see in front of you the results of that work that you just did, that you invented, that you developed and things like that. And, you, and, and then if you had a boss like I did at Earl Bakken, Earl Bakken would never let you go home. In the early days, you know, you go to work early in the morning, blah, 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 it's about five o'clock, the family's waiting at home for dinner and stuff like that. No, 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 we are gonna have another training session tonight and the whole thing. And pacemakers become really inside of you. You think and you talk about pacemakers all the time. So anyway, I never learned about heart valves. I'm sorry. It doesn't go click, click, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, it, it's not electrical. I didn't know anything about it. So Nikolov comes up to me and says, Manny, why don't you make a pace, uh, heart valve now because we, we've done the pacemaker. I said, yeah, okay. So he introduced me to heart valves, okay? And at the time in 1972, there was a lot of them but they all failed. They would make a lot of noise, they would break, they would clog up, they would, they would wear out, things like that. And, uh, and all different designs. If you were a heart surgeon in those days, you wanted a heart valve named after you. So I started learning about heart valves and I was amazed that they would actually take out an organ out of your body, make a hole cut out this, this heart valve, and, I, and I, I remember the first time I followed that little heart valve they took out, and immediately, boom, 
dropped it into a garbage can, into a little garbage bag. You know, the nurse has a, the scrub nurse has a little garbage bag, and was gone. And what was left behind was a hole. Now I know t to a lot of you, so what's the big deal about that? All right, Manny, so they got the, the hole there. All right, what's the big deal? Big deal is when the first time you ever seen it, okay? And then you were going to, you invented a product that was going to be used for the first time, never proven in the body, maybe in a couple of dogs or animals and stuff like that. And you were going to put it in that, that, into that hole and realize that if it failed, for sure we had a problem. So that's why I always look at that hole, because I remember the first time we did the, the St. Jude valve, first implant with Dr. Nikoloff, here at the University of Minnesota. By the way, there's a word that you never want to hear in the OR. You know, many times you hear a lot of, sometimes you hear music, sometimes you hear a lot of language, but the word that you never want to hear in an OR, and that's the word, uh oh. Okay. And that happened to me when we were doing the first St. Jude vow. Okay. In fact, we heard it twice. How many of you work for St. Jude? Okay, these are true stories, first, first one, okay? We get to, got the hole, let's get the valve. Uh-oh, it's the wrong serial number. The serial number actually was written wrong on the package. So I still have that label at home, and I got a line going through the wrong serial number, and I wrote in the correct serial number. Ah, it's going to be a long day today. All right, so I finally put in the valve. And then as I'm kind of going out of the OR, you know, everything's kind of finishing, and I'm turning out to go, all of a sudden, Nikolaus says, uh-oh. Wow, <laughs> okay, what's happening? Well, it's a minor problem. The gradient, you know, when measure the blood pressure between the valve and stuff like that. He said, Manny, this can't be. I said, well, well the, the gradient is a negative gradient. You can't, that can't happen, by the way, okay? But rather than saying that can't happen, I just said, Nick, I told you it's a great valve, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so anyway, we did solve it. It was that the machines in those days to measure gradients were not set low enough because most valves had a high gradient even after you replaced them. And here we came along with the St. Jude valve that had virtually no gradient. So these are all fun events. I hope you're enjoying some of the, the old stories. So anyways, I was saying the old days you went and got a garage or you got a, uh, a basement. I love my, this basement because it was a really high-tech basement. Uh, as you can see here on the wall, we have the latest in technology to help us make decisions, okay? <laughs> We had the latest over here in electronics that, that could help us. And this was a great electronic machine because it also gave you the Twins baseball game. And then, of course, over here, we were fully staffed. And we had here the vice president of trouble. Okay. So we talk about hard valves. And this is uh, another interesting story of, of people working in hard valves. This is one of the first successful long-term mitral implant uh, done by, by Star. And this one lasted 10 years, and not because it failed or anything. It was made totally out of plastic, and, um, but it only lasted 10 years because the guy fell off the roof. He was painting his house or something and fell off the roof and died. So we would never really know. Another valve that was very interesting. Here is a valve that was made entirely out of plastic, okay? The, the ring was painted with a paintbrush of, with black carbon paint because we wanted to make it less thrombogenic, you know, carbon negatively charged material against the red blood cell negatively charged, you know, we repel, so be less thrombogenic. We took a, a um, piece of cloth, Dacron cloth, and impregnated it with, with silicone rubber, and then we we, we mounted it on the valve with a piece of plastic and two little nails. Now, I know we have a gentleman here from the FDA. 
I cannot even imagine that the FDA would look at a valve that was made out of two pieces of plastic, painted with two little nails, tapped in. And I said, who in the world would implant that? Think about it. Would, can you imagine that being implanted? All right? Well, believe it or not, there were 430 some odd patients, okay? And some of the oldest patients lived 25 years with the valve, okay? To be exact, oh, I forgot to tell you the most exciting part, the sewing cuff. Do you notice the sewing cuff? It's made out of styrofoam. Yeah, made out of styrofoam. There's a guy down over there saying, no way, no way, no way, okay? All right, well, here's the, here's the whole thing. It was Dacron reinforced with silicone rubber, cage of graphite coated plastic, okay? Leaflets are anchored by metal pins, 430 implants, sewing cuff, styrofoam. Then the valves evolved into um, single disc valves. We also started seeing the advent of porcine valves. And I remember that at one point in history, um, there was a lot of interest in tissue valves. It kind of, kind of made sense. Well, you know, you're taking out a piece of tissue, you're putting in another tissue, you know, and, and uh, but, you know, they just wouldn't last. The early ones just would not last. They were doing maybe four, five, six years it would last. And I was trying to introduce the St. Jude valve. So I remember going to Boston Mass General Hospital, very serious hospital, the whole thing. I had a meeting at, with some surgeons at night, and, uh, and the, the chief was there and everything, and I was trying to tell them to use the St. Jude valve. No, 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 we don't, we don't do that. No, we're just, we're just doing tissue valves, you know. And I knew at the time, the literature was saying, you know, five years or something like that. And then I said something that, again, any salespeople here? No, uh, you got a few salespeople, okay. Never use this word. I said to the guys, you know, you could be accused of practicing bad medicine. Bad medicine. Never say that, okay? Because the chief of the surgery, and I don't remember his name, actually got off of his desk, actually grabbed my arm, and he said, let me show you to the door. Not only did he show me to the door of his office, he continued to walk down this long, long corridor to the front entrance of the hospital. And I don't know if you've ever been to Mass General Hospital. It has long, big stairs going down to the street. And he walked me out to the top of those stairs, and I thought for sure he was going to push me down those stairs. <laughs> okay. All right? So, remember, never use that word, okay? But a couple of years later, he was doing the St. Jude valve, okay? Now, do you know what, which valve this is? Does anybody know what kind, which valve this is? Come on. That's the original St. Jude valve. Okay? Manny, how come that looks like a pipe fitting at the end? <laughs> well, the truth is it was. That was the concept of it. The concept was that in those days, valves were so bad that they had to, we were constantly taking them out. Surgeon would go in, what do we got? We got a valve replacement. What are we gonna do? Oh, you have to take it out, cut it out, and so on. He says, why don't we just take it out, throw it away, and then screw in a new one? And that was the concept, okay? And of course, this had nice central flow and all these things, and this is what Nikola presented to me. This is a prototype that Nick gave to me. He said, Manny, why don't you go and do a valve? And it kind of made sense, but of course, it wouldn't work. The great valve would open, but it would never close. So that was the predecessor to this valve, the St. Jude valve. We finally got to the St. Jude valve. And, and it was interesting how it was accepted. Several years after we started with this valve, there was an article in the Journal of Thoracic Surgery. Now, that's the Bible of surgery. And we took so many risks and so many innovations, and so many things that were never, never done. You know, you had a ball valve. No such thing as a pivot on a ball valve. You always wanted that ball to keep moving. And then you had the disc valve, you know, the disc like this, no pivots, but then the disc would always be rotating and stuff like that. And I said, what's wrong with pivots? Man, you can't make it out with pivots because they wear out, blah, 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 and all that sort of stuff. 
So we came along and did the St. Jude vow. We didn't have a pivot. We didn't have two pivots. We had four pivots. So in the Journal of Thoracic Surgery, I don't know if it was the annals or what it was, there was three doctors and me wrote a paper. The name of the paper was, open quotation marks, it will never work, close quotation marks, dash the St. Jude valve. So those were the risks that we took. You know, a lot of times when you're developing new products, you're kind of following, what, how are they doing it here? Can I make it a little bit better? But the truth of the matter is, a lesson in innovation is you have to think out of the box. You have to think ahead. You have to take risk. Because if you don't, all you're going to do is make it, instead of this, you're going to make it longer. You're going to make it shorter. You're not going to be creative in, in doing things. I remember 15 years later, a couple of guys came up to me with this picture. This is two sides of the same valve. A patient, 90 days, the valve had thrombose, the St. Jude valve had thrombose. Okay, and if you notice, it's the, the thrombus forms primarily in the pivot area. Okay, so there had to be a better way, and they came to me, Manny, you got to get back in the, in the valve business. Started looking and studying and, and realized that we had to do something to the pivot. And we developed the ATS valve, which is now probably the number two mechanical valve of the world. It's now owned by, by Medtronic. And it was a great valve. We changed the pivot area. We, we could clearly show the benefits over even the St. Jude valve. And this was our first patient. This was Pierre Guillard, who received the ATS valve in 1992. And I always said this is the greatest valve in the world. And to prove it, I took a picture of him 10 years later, and he looks, just looked great. <laughs> Okay, so in 2007, I started working on a new way of improving coronary surgery for, <clears throat> um, and finding out that the most common problem in bypass surgery is that after a certain period of time, the veins would fail because of the high pressure of the heart. Uh, so we developed a method by which we would take these veins that unfortunately would dilate, have a lot of problems, uh, and would cause scarring or, or hyperplasia, and it would start to close down. So we developed a technology, actually it was developed at Medtronic, but we took it and uh, we developed a method by which we would put it around the veins so they would not dilate and would last much longer. In fact, here's how they look at an animal. The lower one was a, a, a vein in a and a sheep at 180 days without, without the mesh. You can see how the thrombus would fill that up. But on the other hand, uh, uh, the picture above was, was the animal, the same animal with, a, with the other vein covered with the mesh. And you can see the difference in the, the performance. It was quite visible, quite dramatic. In the human, on the left-hand side there, you can see a, the untreated vessel. There would be aneurysms, there would be um, stenosis, very slow flow, but, but yet, hold on. But yet, with the treated vessel, it was perfect, just absolutely perfect. We then took a look at this, the same patient. Here is a, at nine months, that perfect vein, and at three years, it was still perfect. We went on to see that patient and about 15 other patients at six years, and they were all perfect. So the, the concept of taking a mesh to put around a vein to strengthen it, uh, we were really able to show that successfully. This is how it looked on a, on a CT angio. We received our CE mark, and we proceeded. Um, but this gave us a chance, a real chance to maybe develop an artificial graft. I mean, let's face it, when you go in to have bypass surgery, they're gonna work on your legs. And I don't know if you've ever seen the operation, it's 
really dramatic. I mean, it's, I don't want to use the word guts and gory and all that sort of stuff, but believe me, it's guts and gory. I'm a little kid from the Bronx, and wow, you know, they open up the legs, they tear them open and stuff like that. Even, even when they now do it with uh, uh, endoscopic procedures and stuff like that, you still have challenges with that. And I said, why can't we make an artificial graft? People have tried for 40, 50 years. No one has done it. I mean, here we are, what, the, the 13th of, of, of April of the year 2016? There is not one single artificial graft for coronary surgery. Well, that sounds like, Manny, it can't be done, which means that's where I go. I like to do it. And that's what I'm doing with, uh, with Medical 21. And this is an example of, of one that we've done. But immediately it comes into play the beginning of this lesson, the lessons that we learn. And I got to remind you of a conversation I had with Lilla High, who told me, but risk must be taken because the greatest heart hazard in life is to risk nothing. The person who risks nothing, does nothing, has nothing, and is nothing. Those are very, very, very strong words. I've been up in front of an audience where a couple of guys I thought for sure were going to throw, you know, throw me out of the room, et cetera, et cetera. But they're true, particularly if you're going after things like trying to do an artificial graft that we're doing at Medical 21. I want to thank you, and I hope that we got some ideas of innovations. Thank you. Hopefully you can uh, stay up here and uh, sure. we have time for some questions. That was a very inspirational talk to myself, I'm sure the entrepreneurs in the room, and hopefully all the students as well. So your career has been amazing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? Oh, come on. Either you were asleep or I got the truth to you. Come on, there's got to be a few questions. The people that are raising their hands are the ones that are holding the mics. They're not raising for questions. Ah, we have a taker. Okay. Thank you so much. It was a fantastic and inspirational talk. My question is, if uh, you would have started your uh, enterprise uh, in like year 2000, for example, that we have such a, uh, a strong control of FDA, do you think you would have done that much or do you think it would have been changed, uh, like the space that we're living, especially with respect to medical devices? Yeah, there's a gentleman here from the FDA, sir. Okay. And uh, the FDA has its purpose, has its job, and of course it creates a challenge for us. Okay. Uh, I think we understand that those are some very big challenges. They have allowed us, however, to do a lot of our work overseas. And in fact, at one point, I remember we're actually encouraging us, Manny, do it overseas rather than here. It'll, it'll be an easier job. I said, yeah, but, you know, there's a lot of doctors that want to do it over here. Um, it is a challenge, and I'm not going to say that it isn't. Uh, you have to be creative in saying how are we going to run a company, particularly if you're a small startup company where you have very limited funds, like Medical 21 as an example, Okay, uh, you have to say, do I go overseas? Now, in, in, my, in my situation, I began my career overseas. I, when I first joined Medtronic, I have, was already working for them indirectly overseas. So I, in my entire career, I've been doing work overseas. So all of our stuff uh, we did initially overseas. Even when we did the pacemaker, I remember going to France, uh, before we did our first implants, and the doctor asked me, well, can I see the pacemaker? And I reached in my pocket, I pulled out, and there was a wooden pacemaker. <laughs> because my engineers were late and they couldn't give me a model, so some, one engineer actually took a piece of wood, a little balsa wood, carved it out, and that was how the pacemaker was gonna look, and that's what I had in my pocket. And that pacemaker, if you want to see it, it's at the, um, 
well, now it's Boston Scientific, uh, the original plants over in uh, Arden Hills of, of Guidant is still there. But FDA is here to do a job, they're doing a good job, and we have to learn to how we study, how we bring data to them. Uh, we have advisors, we have a company here, TUV, that's, that's gonna help us, and you just gotta do it. Would it, would it have been more successful or less successful? I don't know. At the end of the day, we did it, okay? It's, it's hard, okay? We have Susan Alpert in the audience. If you really wanna know anything about the FDA and stuff like that, how to work with them, find Susan. She's here somewhere. Question over here. Okay, question over there? Yes, I have a question. Um, when you say you, you're thinking all the time, Yeah. how do you sleep at night? How do I sleep at night? Yes. <laughs> You know, I think I, I sleep pretty, pretty well. But I do get up early in the morning, and I start. And, and once you get one idea, you don't have to do a whole bunch of them. I have, I've been very, sometimes I've been criticized. I said, Manny, why did you do St. Jude outside of CPI? Why didn't you just do it, you know? And I remember when talking to Nick and... And he said, uh, Manny, why don't you do a valve? And I said, really, what, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to do a valve inside a CPI. So I went to the other guys and I said, hey, guys, why don't we do a valve? Nick, our friend, wants us to do a valve. And at that time, at CPI, we were open 24 hours a day. We had three shifts. The lights were never turned off. We had a the third shift was just to clean the floor, empty out the toilet, you know, and empty out the baskets and stuff like that, and put new product, new components on the production line, because we had two lines of production, and the third line was just to clean and, and recycle. So one guy says, we're gonna do a valve? I said, what are you talking about, man? We don't even have time to go to the potty, okay? So I said, okay, well then if you don't mind, I'm gonna, I've done my thing here, so I'm gonna do that, and it's separate. And I've always believed that Keep your ideas, and if you got more than one, do them one at a time, because always your prime product, the one that's paying the light bill, the one that's paying your staff, will always receive the most attention. It's the baby that you're, but the new one will suffer. Now, when you're doing a hard valve, you gotta have full attention. Now, how could you get full attention when you're doing CPI 24 hours a day? So that's why I do, do it separately. And so you asked the question about keeping an eye here. You know, just do one, do it, and then, if you, then you do the next one. I don't, I don't do two at a time. Art. Art. Manny. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, my guess is that uh, Medical 21 is going to get money. Yes. Right? Yeah. And then you're going to be hiring. And I, we have lots of undergraduates and graduate students from around the country here have come into the conference. Can you yeah. give them some advice? You know, what are the characteristics that you would be looking for uh, for someone you would hire in, in Medical 21? Wow, okay. Uh, one of the, the other things that you'll learn about me is A, doing it one at a time. The first thing I gotta do is raise some money. Then I will have a very minimal staff I've already identified the staff because they've been with me and they, they, want, they want to be part of it. But then as we start hiring, um, we'll have a few and it'll be a while. I mean, right now I have to do my animal work first, okay? And uh, then we have to do our human work and it'll be primarily overseas, okay? Uh, engineers, uh, I could use a couple of more engineers for sure. Right now, I could for sure use some administrative person to help me because I'm doing everything right now by myself. Um, I, I don't know how to answer that question, Art. I mean, we just go along and we... What recommendations would you have to the students? Oh, the students. Okay, I do have something. Okay. I always used to teach um, students, you know, sometimes the father or the mother would say, Manny, will you do me a favor, talk to my daughter or my son, 
who was getting out of college and what to do, you know. And I would always say, all right, you know, get, get a job at Medtronic or St. Jude or one of the bigger companies and learn something and then maybe someday you can do, you know, you can do it on your own. You, you find out what you want to do. I don't, I don't say that anymore. What I now say is I like to get the student around the end of sophomore year, maybe the beginning of, of junior year, and I said, if you find something that you like in the field, in the lab, in wherever you're doing it, grab that, put it in your soul, stick with it throughout, throughout the rest of your, your bachelor, and then it's going to master's, et cetera, with that, and make that your pursuit of happiness. Go and just do that. You'll be better off than trying to go to a large company and find that, you know? And, and, and the universities are here to teach you that. Um, that's what I do now, you know? And I have students who have come to me. I said, Manny, I did exactly that. And I've been working now on this particular thing for two years. Great. One last question back, back to you. Uh, Okay, you got it. You got the mic in your hand. You got it. Oh no, there's another one. Oh, two, questions. two questions. All right, two of them. I'm, I'm going to jump Short in questions. since I'm up Go here. Ahead. I've, I've happened to work for two of your companies. Which which one? Uh, CPI and St. Jude Medical. Okay. So thank you for everything you've done, both locally and nationally. Thank you. And um, so when you in start so many companies, you kind of run out of ideas and letters. Can you tell the backstory on how you named each of the companies? I, I, I have started uh, seven publicly held companies, working on number eight, uh, which is a challenge both technically and also financially to do. And um, run out of ideas. I got at least three, four companies in my brain right now I could do tomorrow morning. If, <laughs> if I get drunk or something, I don't know, okay? <laughs> and, uh, but thank you very much for your, for your kind words. I, you know, it's been fun. And the last question okay. in the back there. So, um, what makes the University of Minnesota such a hub for medical innovation? I mean, it's not only cardiac, but it's also orthopedic surgery, spine surgery, neurosurgery. In all those specialties, there's so many innovations, Mayo Clinic, uh, both in medical device and administrative. So what makes you, the University of Minnesota, to you, very, very innovative in, in the medical device industry? If there was, if there was, uh, if you were a child and there was a special school that would teach you how to walk and run faster and better than any other, you would go to that university, okay? The University of Minnesota has been around here for a long, long time and started these, these innovations where people within it took risk and started these things. Then they continue it. They have here a, a research center headed up by Dr. Bianco. I don't know if, if, if any of you have used it, but phenomenal. I, I personally have said that many of the medical companies in this town would not exist if it wasn't for the work that came out of that lab, you know? And, um, and they still do it, and they still do it. I know that if I need some animal work, I mean, there's a lot of places I can go to these days, okay? But Dick and his group, I, I go to him, I say, okay, all right, Dick, can you do this? Can you do that? How much is it gonna cost, et cetera? Are you competitive with the other things? And that's a different story, okay, altogether, because there are some good sponsors here, uh, Surpass being one, and then there's another gentleman uh, from Montreal that I was talking to, uh, Francois. I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of your company, but it's here, okay? And, and you know, these are people that will help you do your original animal work. But why Minnesota would be a better question. Why Minnesota and not just the University of Minnesota? And that is because we had the industries here. We had the computer industry, controlled data. We had the healthcare industry, a little company called 3M used to be the biggest medical company in the world at one time, okay? Then we had the financial. I mean, you had the, the Craig Hallens, the Piper Jaffries, the Dean Witters, all were Minnesota companies that had money to be made, okay? You had the Honeywells. 
Then you had all those people who invested in those things, made money, and then they said, now what do we do? Well, we, we, we put in a little company called Medtronic that makes money, and then a little guy raises his hand, a little kid says, I need some money to start CPI, and we raise money. And so this became the mecca for medical devices because of the school, because of all the different industries, including the financial industry that helped do this. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you much. much. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you.